major premise, uh, which is our here, is that a church that departs from apostolic practices is a false church. And I'm assuming most of you uh, would not want to go here. But really, this is actually the place to go. As shocking as it sounds, you know, to say, well, actually, a church that departs from apostolic practice is not a necessarily a false church. That, that sounds crazy. That sounds wild. But I'll explain a few things and then uh, it'll actually make sense uh, what I'm saying here. So first, we need to ask, what does it mean for something to be an apostolic practice? Um, because really, to call something an apostolic practice actually doesn't tell us much. Um, it, it kind of every time I hear this argument it reminds me of a conversation I actually had with a family member. Um, they're, they're Pentecostal and, uh, we were having a conversation about the way in which catechesis works in the church and the way, you know, RCIA and reception and baptism and the way in which baptism works in their church. And I explained to him, you know, the, the sort of lengthy process of catechesis and that's, you know, a patristic practice of, uh, you know, the moral, spiritual and doctrinal, um, teachings that must occur in order for one to receive the sacraments. And what he did is he actually pointed to the book of Acts. And he said, well, look at the book of Acts, the way in which, you know, Peter preached to all of these individuals and they were baptized the same day from a profession of faith and repentance. And you see multiple instances, you know, of this, of this giving of the sacraments happening in a relatively short period of time. So doesn't it seem like you're going against the apostolic practices? And that was basically his argument. And I mean, this is a familiar argument. And I think that if the Orthodox or anybody else who wants to give an argument in a similar form, if they were to argue, well, X is an apostolic practice. Um, and, you know, if you depart from an apostolic practice, you're an apostate church. Therefore, you're an apostate church. Arguing in this form, you need to be very careful. Because very quickly, uh, from what we know from history and then from also uh, divine revelation, what we know from these, th this can become a very dangerous argument to try to put forward and can actually screw you over in the end. And the example of talking with that family member uh, is a very clear one because I explained to him basically what I'm about to explain to you now is that basically apostolic only tells you about the origin of something. It's all it tells you. Apostolic just means from the apostles. It doesn't tell you any more than that. It doesn't tell you any less than that. Apostolic actually doesn't mean, you know, it's something of divine law. Apostolic uh, really just means, it just identifies who the legislat legislator is. So, for example, if I said this is an ecclesiastical law, or this is made by the church, basically ecclesiastical means made by the church. So if I say uh, the Nicene Creed is ecclesiastical, I would basically by identifying it as the creed was formulated by the church. This doesn't mean that this wasn't something which uh, is identical with the faith preached by the apostles and therefore can also be called apostolic. And also doesn't mean that it's something that's uh, divine. Uh, that is something which uh, comes from God since it's from divine revelation. But really, most properly speaking, it's ecclesiastical. So all apostolic tells you is the origins of the practice. So uh, with from the example that I that I kind of gave you with um, with those uh, baptismal practices of the apostles, we could very easily see a fundamental distinction uh, that we're going to have to draw in the beginning. And uh, this is broadly speaking. I mean, there's other categories we could put this in, but broadly speaking, it's between apostolic, sorry, apostolic divine law and apostolic positive law. So basically the apostolic divine law are certain precepts or laws or judgments given by the apostles that are given under the inspiration of God, under the special inspiration of God, not merely the general protection, not mere uh, as, as legislators, but actually divine inspiration. So we can say truly in a sense that this is the word of God. Well, not really in a sense, simply speaking, we can say this is the word of God. So when the apostles say, you know, repent of your sins, be baptized, 
and so on. When they're saying these things, these are they are actually laying down apostolic divine law. When they say don't fornicate, don't commit adultery, blah, 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 they're actually laying down apostolic divine law. This is very important. And uh, on the other hand, we can also have an apostolic positive law. So apostolic positive law basically means that the authority comes from the will of the legislator. And of course, the, the apostles, they're true legislators. They truly make laws that are truly binding. So, um, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a very good example. Oh, yeah. When, when, they, um, when the apostles went around and structured the structuring of local churches and said, well, the deacons are supposed to do this and they're supposed to wear this. You're supposed to meet at this time. You know, let's let's meet at uh, 6 a.m. on Sunday. That is an apostolic positive law or, you know, uh, right after preaching and repentance, you are to be baptized. That's an apostolic positive law. And it comes from their authority as legislators, not their authority necessarily uh, as inspired by God. So it comes from their own authority and what has been what has been given to them. So the main difference between these two, really the, the important difference, at least for what we're going to say here, is that when it comes to apostolic divine law, apostolic divine law is completely immutable. It's completely immutable. And the reason that it's immutable is because it's divine revelation. It comes from uh, the immutable will of God. So when they say don't fornicate, you can't change don't fornicate. When they say, you know, be baptized, you can't change don't be, yeah, be baptized. When they say repent, you can't change repent. Those are all coming from them insofar as they are divine legates, insofar as they're messengers from God. But when they say, you know, meet on Sunday at 6 a.m., or when they say this feast is to be celebrated this day, or when they say, um, you know, you have to fast two days before baptism or whatever. When they when they put all these laws out, since they are positive laws and they're coming from them as legislators, you know, a society is not perpetually bound to the will of uh, each generation of legislator. You know, just because the, uh, and this is actually an issue in broader tradism, if you may, is that when it comes to, for example, the mass said in Latin, if Pope Pius V says that the mass is to be said in Latin, he is acting um, not as teaching somehow doctrine, and this would be, you know, teaching something explicitly or implicitly contained in divine revelation and therefore be laying down law, which is divine and therefore immutable. Rather, he's laying down positive law. So it's, it's authority is gathered from the will of the legislator. So a future pope could say, you know, let's do it in the vernacular for this or that reason. 